This is a production of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. There will be no bottleneck in our determination to aid Great Britain. No dictator, no combination of dictators will weaken that determination by threats of how they will construe that determination. The dawn of 1941 saw a world at war. German armies, fresh from lightning victories in Czechoslovakia, Poland and France, had all but secured Hitler's fortress Europe. Great Britain, standing alone, was engaged in a desperate battle for survival. On January 6, 1941, American President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, in a speech to Congress, asked for authority and for funds sufficient to manufacture additional munitions and war supplies of many kinds to be turned over to those nations which are now in actual war with aggressor nations. Known as the Lend-Lease Act, America itself edged closer to war. In the years leading up to World War II, mission boards representing many denominations funneled vast resources into Africa, Asia, and Latin America. For these people, the Great Commission was taken literally. Go, therefore, into all the world and preach the gospel. Often, the call to mission required a long-term commitment, separating family and friends for years at a time. In those days, a commitment to foreign mission involved long journeys by train, steamer, and sometimes even by foot. With the outbreak of war in Europe, the conflict soon spread across the globe. German East Africa was no exception. British forces taking control of the strategic colony had interned German Lutheran missionaries leaving the African church without pastors, teachers, or medical personnel. In May 1940, veteran Augustana Lutheran missionary Reverend Elmer Danielson responded to a call from the East Africa Church. Leaving his wife Lillian and their six children behind, Danielson left for Africa in the hope his family would join him in the future, a hope that was not to be. Ever since 1928, Daddy and I, my husband and I went out to Africa and we'd come home every four or five years. And now this was one of our furloughs, and we were going back out again. But then when it got time to go, there were such difficulties out there. There was uh, war, and uh, so then it was decided it was best that my husband and I and the children didn't go right then. And so then we stayed home. But then we prayed about it, and it seemed that we should go. We didn't have peace any other way, but he would go alone. And so we decided to stay home, the children and I. And then he left in May 1940. Nearly one year later, Mrs. Danielson received a message from the Augustana Mission Board informing her that a neutral passenger ship the Egyptian liner Zamzam was scheduled to depart New York bound for various ports in Africa. Seizing the opportunity, Lillian gathered her six children, aged 18 months to 11 years, and boarded a train for New York. We were there about two, three days waiting for the ship and then finally got word that it was going to go the next day. So we, Amy Ball, took us down to the boat and that's where we met all of the rest of the people going out. Formerly a Bibi Line steamer under the British flag, the Zamzam was sold to Egypt shortly before the outbreak of World War II. In the spring of 1941, Egypt was a neutral country, and the rickety old Zamzam liner 
represented one of the few means of civilian transport to Africa. The Zamzam's 201 passengers were a diverse group. They included 24 volunteer ambulance drivers hoping to join British forces in North Africa, a contingent of tobacco buyers from Wilson, North Carolina, and 144 missionaries representing 20 denominations. Of this complement, 33 were children. One passenger aboard the Zamzam, who was neither a missionary nor an ambulance driver, was Dave Sherman. A photographer for Life magazine, Sherman was on his way to cover the war in North Africa. The Zamzam was a curious incident because the, the people on board were so absolutely disparate. Uh, they were like chalk and cheese. There were the missionaries who were a body of their own, devout and praying. Uh, and meaningful. There were the ambulance drivers who were clowning on board, the, on board the ship, some of whom were trying to avoid the draft, some of whom were honestly and conscientiously trying to become ambulance drivers for the British. For the most part, they were pretty dissolute, and the missionaries had doomed them to, uh, to eternal damnation. The children in our family at that time ranged from Lois, who was about a year and a half, to Lawrence, who was nearing 11 and I'm second oldest. So I was old enough, I feel, to remember it somewhat and yet not, I'm sure I didn't realize the seriousness of it and I didn't see it through adult eyes at all. The V. Eugene Johnson family was also on the Zam Zam. I was just short of 10, just a couple months short of being 10. And I was one of the, quote, older boys in among the children and because of that had uh, probably more privileges than the younger ones did. Uh, my recollection of the whole incident is one of more adventure than fear or sadness. Uh, I recall a couple of instances of being apprehensive, but it was much more of an adventure for me. Following the implementation of the American Lend-Lease Act, Germany had stepped up their withering U-boat attacks on merchant shipping. A journey across the Atlantic Ocean in 1941 was perilous by any stretch of the imagination. The SS Zamzam left New York Harbor on March 20, 1941 for Suez, via Trinidad, Pernambuco, Cape Town and Mombasa. The Zamzam was commanded by a British officer William Gray Smith. Several weeks into the voyage, acting under orders from the British Admiralty, Smith mysteriously had the Zamzam black out. This tactic was normally used by merchant vessels in an effort to hide from hostile submarines and surface raiders. For the Zamzam, the maneuver meant that the ship was an open target. I recall my father becoming very upset when we left Recife, Pernambuco, uh, the ship was blacked out. And he made a big fuss about that. He said, we signed on, it's a neutral ship, it should not be blacked out, and he made a big issue of that. And um, the ship was, it was traveling blacked out. And of course, if it's in wartime, and it's not your ship, and it's blacked out, it's fair game. I must say, the people, the, the missionaries and the tobacco buyers on board the Zam Zam, who sailed out of New York Harbor and suddenly found their ship blacked out, their reaction was quite angry. And they went to the captain of the ship and they said, we were told that this was a neutral vessel and that we were not going to sail as a warship blacked out. What's going on? And the skipper said, I'm sailing under Admiralty orders and, we'll, and, I'm, the, and I'm the captain of the ship and we're sailing blacked out. At dawn on the morning of April 17, 1941, the German raider ship Atlantis drifted quietly in the warm South Atlantic waters off Cape Town, South Africa. For hours, Captain Bernhard Rogger had tracked what he believed to be the British troop ship, the SS Leicestershire. Unaware that the distinctive four-masted steamer had been sold to Egypt, Rogger ordered his six-inch guns to fire at 525, 
there appeared on our port side a uh, very, very sinister-looking shape, out of which came what we thought first were winking lights, but which turned out to be the shots from six-inch cannon fore and aft of a German mystery ship, or raider, or Q ship, as they were called, which, was, which, had, which had the name Tamesis written on it, uh, or the Atlantis. That was her original title. She was a Norwegian merchantman who had been rigged as a warship and was able to change her silhouette from day to day by changing the position of the funnel, by erecting various things on the superstructure. And that was the ship that sunk us. The first salvo from the raider fell short. The second sailed over the Zamzam's bow. The third slammed into the wireless cabin, ripping it to pieces. All at once, I heard a terrific bang. I wondered what that was. And I rushed to the door, looked out, and way over there on the horizon, I saw a ship. And as I kept looking, there was another bang, and I saw the fire spurt. Then I knew we were something was happening that shouldn't happen to us. I rushed in, and the children had come from the other room in, and they said, Mommy, what is it? And I said, well, an enemy bolt is firing at us. But you little children, you have to be brave. Help get your ja life jackets on quickly. My memories are of the shelling, not knowing where the next shell would hit. But I remember how Mother stayed so calm. She sort of uh, advised us what to do, you know, get your jackets on, help one another, come in this little cabin, stay together here. But through it all, she was saying very calmly, remember, kitties, whatever happens, Jesus loves you. I recall being awakened by the noise of the shelling, shells hitting. And my father explained to us immediately what was happening and telling us to put on uh, life jackets and get ready to leave. I don't recall panic there or fear. Um, I thought, well, you know, what's going on? And we were going to wait there. And then uh, <clears throat> I know there was a major sh hit of a shell on our side. And so anyway, my dad said we had to go to the lifeboats. And so we all were, were headed for the lifeboats. And the whole room would shake, and the uh, sink came down, and the mirrors came down. We were sure that it wiped out their cabin next to us. And there were, then those shells would be hissing over and it when nothing had happened because they'd missed the ship. But just the waiting for the expectation, the next shell was sure that would be, or I was sure it was going to get a cabin. I know my mother was somewhat worried and uh, um, we, we were on the side of the ship where the, the Tamasus was shelling. And she, uh, I, I remember being disappointed because she wanted me to keep my head down and I wanted to see what was going on. Then when the shelling had stopped and we were about to leave the cabin, before we left, Mother huddled us in a prayer that if we would not all be together in this world as a family again, she prayed that we would be together later in heaven. In the next few minutes, the raider ship lobbed 55 shells at the Zamzam as passengers abandoned ship. In one overcrowded lifeboat, Lillian Danielson and her six children watched in horror as the ocean gushed through gaping holes left by exploding shrapnel. We saw that the water was coming in more than we thought, and some took off their shoes. I said, here's my son's helmet, take that. And and everybody, some scoop of their hands, but it didn't do any good. And the boat was just a little bit more. And somebody said, oh, this boat's leaking like a sieve. I remember going out, getting in the lifeboat. Uh, there was a lot of confusion, and a lot of the uh, Egyptian uh, crew people were practically panicked. They were really wild. And then it just went down from under us. It seems to me that I went underwater, but maybe not. Maybe I didn't completely submerge. I just remember a lot of splashing, a lot of commotion until we all got heads up and uh, 
uh, everyone could see where we were. Mother calling, Lawrence, grab Luella there. Or Eleanor and Evelyn, link your arms, come in closer. So we wouldn't scatter in all directions. The story of the sinking lifeboats is a famous one. The story of Lillian and how she shepherded her six children behind her with their life jackets so that they went through the water like a mother duck and her six ducklings behind them has become really one of the most heroic and famous stories of the, of the whole episode. Uh, she said, trust in Jesus, children, and he will save you, or words to that effect. Uh, and indeed, the children were saved. I believe that one of the smaller children was saved by one of the Egyptians who was sitting on the bottom of one of the overturned lifeboats who took the child on board the bottom of the lifeboat with him. It's very vivid when we were in our lifeboat and our lifeboat sunk, and I can really remember just going down under the water and coming up, and then somebody put me on top of the bottom of the lifeboat. And I remember rocking up there and being so afraid that I would fall off into the water again. And I felt so bad that I had taken the children. I didn't think so much of myself, but that I had brought six children out to have this adventure in the ocean and perhaps lose their lives. And just as we were there, I said to the children, little children now, be brave in Jesus. Jesus loves you more than mother and daddy do. And just keep praying. Keep your mouths closed. That was so they wouldn't get that water in them. We were in the water only about 45 minutes when the, the raider, the uh, warship was a raider, uh, came toward us. And uh, it was a rather dismal, tense scene as there were two boatloads of us in the water and other boats on the water. Uh, and the Zam Zam tilted and slowly sinking, and this raider approaching, not knowing if it would be friendly or not. And across the sky came the most glorious rainbow that it seemed right then and there God put, put there as a special sign, a reminder of his promise to be with us and his care and love. After the German raider discovered who was aboard the Zam Zam, passengers were hauled from the water to safety. The captain, he asked us who were ahead of the family to come up and he would find out how many were, had died that night. And uh, he asked different ones and they related. Then he came to me and he said, Mother, how many did you lose? I said, I thank God he saved us all. He said, I've never heard anything like it. We saw we shot 55 shells at you, and uh, to know that no one was killed, there were several injured very badly, but no one was killed. He says, I've never heard anything like it. As the war in Europe dragged on, Germany walked a slender political tightrope. Desperate to keep the United States out of the conflict, the commander of the raider ship was dismayed to learn the Zam Zam's passengers included 141 Americans. After finishing off the crippled and listing steamer, the raider ship transferred passengers to the German blockade runner Dresden, where they were to spend the next month sailing north for occupied France. For family and friends back home and on the mission field in Africa, the fate of the Zam Zam and its passengers remained a mystery. I was waiting for them on the Wembera Plains, and I was getting awfully restless. I said, why haven't we heard from them? We expected a cable from them when they got to Cape Town, and it didn't come, didn't come, didn't come. And over two, two, two weeks after we thought they would be in Cape Town, no word from them. But it was quiet in the morning when 7 o'clock Ruth came in and said, Stan wants to see me outside. And I said, that's strange. And I wondered what had happened. And so I went out, and there's sort of what we call a crawl or a courtyard with a fence. And Stan took my arm and walked me around. I could see on his face something really had happened. But I thought his wife had gotten critically sick. She hadn't been feeling very well. Somehow or another, the sinking of the Zam Zam didn't cross my mind. 
But we got her on after a couple times, and he said, last night it came over the radio, that the Van Zandt is long half to do. And uh, it is taken for granted, it has been sunk by enemy action, and everybody's lost. Thinking now in the situation, that probably my dad had the hardest time being on Africa and wondering the uncertainty of what happened in weeks and weeks of not knowing and uh, no news. And it turned out we were on this Dresden or the prison ship for 32 days, unofficially uh, prisoners of war. United States was not in the war yet, so you know we were really not prisoners of war. But for all practical purposes. We lived as such, with uh, very limited food, very limited fresh water, crowded spaces for sleeping, lack of toilet facilities. And yet, you know, uh, I'm amazed at how children adjust to circumstances like that if adults don't make too much fuss over it. We were given cotton sacks, which were filled with, uh, with cheap cotton bales, which happened to be on board, and made into ticks to sleep on and we slept below decks for the next month. Uh, we were kept below decks at night. We were allowed up at daybreak and had to go down again at night. And there was a guard at the top of our stair to make sure that nobody, nobody came out. Finally, the captain told us he was going to take us to German-occupied France. And to get there, we went through what was known as the British blockade. So for about a week's time, night and day, we traveled through the stretch of water, knowing that at any time a submarine might come or a plane overhead or warships. One time we actually saw a convoy of British ships and thought, well, now they'll, they'll sink us and this will be the end. But uh, they passed by. 24 hours after learning of the Zamzam sinking, Elmer Danielson concluded that his wife Lillian and their six children would have wanted him to carry on. Only after conducting a funeral service and a baptism did Pastor Danielson allow himself time to grieve. The uh, chief engineer, Peter Marshall, and his wife, they were Christian people. She also heard about the sinking of the Zam Zam, and she was just broken to pieces. And she said, turn on the radio. Out there, uh, the only news of the world that we got was when the BBC broadcast at 6 o'clock to East Africa, and we got it at 9 o'clock. And sometimes we turned it off after the headlines because we had no way of charging the batteries that ran the, ran, ran, uh, that, uh, ran the radio. So we said to her, Mrs. Marshall, it's no use. And we were so tired, and we had all the way to the King Boy to go. She said, it's too late. It's over. It was after nine. She begged us. And just to please her, we turned it on. And there are a few words at the next to the last broadcast over BBC, just as plainly as could be. I don't remember one word. And then the very last news item was, it has been confirmed by the Vichy government that 140 of the 142 Americans on the Zam Zam are safe and have been landed at saint Louis in occupied France. Good night. You talk about God's intervention. In that whole story, as far as our life is concerned, he intervened more than once, and he intervened for my sake right there. Fifty years later, the events of April 1941 still have an impact on the survivors. Today, Lillian and Elmer Danielson are retired to their home in Lindsborg, Kansas, where they are often joined by their children. I think it was a miracle, but I do think that every family has a lot of miracles.
and that every life has a lot of miracles. And sometimes I think we might start to, you know, center on that too much and and not be aware that that there are so many miracles all the time occurring. We just don't even sometimes become aware of it. Looking back with so many feelings of gratitude and most of all that God had spared our lives and our family kind of um, has felt we were saved to serve in whatever way God could use us. And that, that too is a challenge for every, every human being has been given the gift of life and um, to be used to God's glory however he, uh, however he can use us.